got to believe. This goal was founded on faith and on belief. I told you last week how when Notre Dame burnt down, Father Soren said the mistake we made was we didn't build it big enough. Everything here at Notre Dame has been done on faith and a commitment to excellence, a commitment to each other. The luncheon yesterday, I was asked what Notre Dame meant to me. One, it means religion. Two, it means family, where people care about you, not just because you win or because things go well, but they genuinely care. The other thing it means to me is a set of standards, a commitment. 1986, people were saying Notre Dame would never win again. We had a group of guys that wanted to win but didn't know how. Then we progressed to the point where we had a group of guys that wanted to win, knew how to win. And then we progressed to the point where we have a group of guys that know how to win, but sometimes we don't always exhibit it. And that's a thing in the past. We're not going out and defending anything. We're going out to fight for it, to compete for it. Nobody gives you anything in this world. The people can give you money and give you wealth and give you fame. The one thing nobody in this world can give you, men, is respect. The self-respect you have for yourself, the way you play the game and the way you believe, the way you do things. This is a game of respect. You are Notre Dame. You are special. But you represent Notre Dame. You represent everybody that came before you and everybody that will come after you. At Notre Dame, there's a spirit. The spirit is something that's within you. You've got to listen to that spirit, you've got to fight for it, and you've got to believe it. The spirited commitment made by Irish head coach Lou Holtz and his players for the 1992 football season legitimately began nearly a year before Notre Dame opened the season in September against Northwestern. The seeds for 92 actually were sown in the aftermath of two late season losses in 1991 as the Irish prepared to face third ranked Florida in the Sugar Bowl. A decided underdog against the Southeastern Conference champion Gators Notre Dame pulled a nifty about face, especially on the defensive side of the ball. The Irish held once beaten Florida without a touchdown for 53 minutes. They used coverage oriented strategy to frustrate Gator quarterback Shane Matthews time after time. And they made the going especially sticky for the Gators any time they approached the Irish goal line. Meanwhile, the Notre Dame offense and the running game in particular put on a second half clinic down 13-0 at one point and 16-7 at halftime, the Irish ran for 245 yards in the last two periods alone. Rick Meyer completed 14 of his 19 throws, including touchdown passes to Lake Dawson and Irv Smith. But it was Jerome Bettis, Rodney Culver, Tony Brooks, and the Irish offensive line that dominated the final two periods. Bettis ran for 150 yards by himself, scoring all three of his touchdowns in a three-minute span late in the final period. The 39-28 Notre Dame victory set the standard for the season to come and let Holtz and his Irish see exactly where they wanted to end up by the time the 92 campaign concluded. With nine starters returning on defense and an offensive nucleus featuring Meyer, Bettis, Dawson, Smith, and offensive line starters Aaron Taylor, Justin Hall, and Lindsey Knapp. The Irish again had the potential to be one of the nation's better football teams. How well would all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place for the 1992 Irish? 11 fall Saturdays to come would provide the answer. A season opener in any sport is rife with questions about ability and chemistry and potential. Never was that more true than when third-ranked Notre Dame kicked off the 92 campaign against Northwestern. The site was Chicago's Soldier Field, 
a facility in which Notre Dame hadn't played in 50 years, and a place where the Irish had never lost in nine previous appearances. Holtz openly admitted that Irish fans had been telling him that 1992 was going to be the year. The Wildcats would provide the first indication as to whether or not those expectations were justified. Reggie Brooks set the tone for his record-breaking season on the very first Irish possession with a pair of gains in double figures. Rick Meyer threw first to Irv Smith. Next to Mike Miller. And finally to Oscar McBride for the six points. The impressive 80-yard drive ended in a quick 7-0 Irish lead. On their way to 391 rushing yards, Brooks and fullback Jerome Bettis pounded away at the Wildcat defenders on their way to a 14-7 halftime edge. While the Irish defense gave up its share of yards to quarterback Len Williams and a controlled Northwestern passing game, Notre Dame proved particularly stingy around the goal line. The Irish held tight early to force a missed field goal. Down just 14-7 in the third period, the Wildcats advanced to the Irish 25, only to have consecutive sacks by Devon McDonald fourth their chances. From there, the Irish offense exploded. On third and 16, Miller provided a hint of Notre Dame's big play potential. Meyer back to throw, going for the home run. Got Miller, 35-30, it's gonna be a touchdown for Notre Dame. 10-5, a score, 70 yards. The Irish defense put together an impressive goal line stand, stopping the Wildcats four times from the five. And that seemed to take the air out of the Northwestern hopes. Brooks supplied one of the final blows in the 42-7 victory. Here's Meyer on the handoff, the ball going to the tailback. Brooks breaks the tackle, gets away from another, cuts to the left. He's going to run for a touchdown at the 50. There's no one near him. At the 30, at the 15, the 10, the 5, and a touchdown by Reggie Brooks, all because he brought two tackles on the way. The Irish still had some tinkering to do with their defense, but 157 rushing yards from Brooks and 130 more from Bettis suggested that the Notre Dame ground game hadn't lost its touch. With a game under its belt, Notre Dame turned its attention to fifth-ranked Michigan, a team playing for the first time. The two top 10 heavyweights traded punches for 60 minutes, and both provided definite indications that their ratings in the early season polls were no accident. After neither team scored on its initial possession, the Irish put together a 67-yard drive to take the lead. It was capped by maybe the most amazing run Irish fans would see all season from Brooks. Here's the pitch to Brooks, and Brooks spins, gets down to the 20, still on his feet, 15, down to the 10, at the 5, to the goal line. He's got a touchdown. What a great run by Reggie Brooks. Notre Dame had rolled up 232 total yards by halftime, but it was the Irish defense that set the tone early. Cornerback Tom Carter made sure the Wolverines turned back the football after a fourth down attempt in the opening period. Then he took things into his own hands late in the second period. After Michigan took a 10-point lead on the first play of the fourth quarter, the Irish offense went back to work. Rick Meyer found Lake Dawson on a curl, good for 21 yards. Then Jerome Bettis turned the corner for 18 more. Meyer rifled one to Dawson for a fourth down conversion for the Irish, and a Bettis TD run brought Notre Dame within 17-14. Turnovers proved to be key elements all afternoon, and never was that more apparent than in the final 15 minutes. Linebacker Brian Radigan set the Irish up in prime position with an interception deep in Michigan territory. After Meyer hurdled his way to the 15, 
Craig Hendrick knocked through the field goal with 5.28 left to tie the game at 17. The Wolverines had one more shot, but this time it was Jeff Burris who dashed the Michigan hopes. His pickoff at the Irish 12-yard line marking the third interception of the afternoon against the Wolverines' Elvis Gerback. The Irish limited Michigan's vaunted ground game to 136 rushing yards, while the Irish finished with more than 100 yards more. The result may not have been what either sideline had sought, but the first tie in Notre Dame Stadium in 23 years kept both teams alive in the national title hunt. The Irish headed for Spartan Stadium concerned, as always, about Michigan State's challenging defensive scheme. The Spartans, coming off an upset loss to Central Michigan, figured to arrive in a specially feisty fashion. But this time, the Notre Dame coaching staff sensed a vulnerability in George Perlis' secondary. And Rick Meyer wasted no time determining whether or not that observation would prove legitimate. Meyer made use of a near-perfect fake to give himself all kinds of time to zero in on Lake Dawson for a 43-yard gain on the game's very first play. That effort set the tone for a first half in which the Irish peppered the airwaves in spectacular manner. Meyer found Oscar McBride for the TD five plays later, and the Irish were off to the races. Meyer began the next possession by throwing to Dawson again and finished it with a seven-yard scoring strike to the junior split in. Later in the same period, Meyer hooked up with his favorite receiver once more. The Irish made it 28-3 on the third play of the second period when Meyer threw long for Ray Griggs. Meanwhile, Tom Carter and John Covington made sure the Spartans didn't get anything started at their end. The one time in the first half that Michigan State did put a touchdown on the board, Lee Becton had a quick answer. It'll come down to Becton, says I want it, takes it at the 23. Gets up to the 30, cuts to the left, to the 35, to the 40. That's one man to beat, to the 50, 45. He could go all the way. Got a blocker at the 30, the 20. Hit, knocked down at the 15, down the sideline, 10-5. Touchdown, Notre Dame. That gave Notre Dame an insurmountable 38 to 10 halftime lead as the Irish scored on their first six possessions. In the first two periods alone, Meyer threw 12 completions on 24 attempts for 253 yards and three TD. Reggie Brooks added a third period score. Then the air raid continued as Derek Mays made a one-handed grab of a Kevin McDougal toss on the first play of the fourth period to make it 52-10. The Spartans rebounded to make the final score 52-31, but it wasn't enough to keep the Irish from taking home their sixth straight win over Michigan State. Interstate rival Purdue came to town on the heels of a noteworthy season opening upset of 17th ranked California. The Boilers' resurgent rushing attack featured tailback Jeff Hill, who had rushed for 100 yards in each of the Boilermakers' first two outings. But it was the Irish who put on another offensive show, and Reggie Brooks was the running back whose name was on the lips of the fans leaving Notre Dame Stadium before the afternoon was over. Jerome Bettis did most of the damage on Notre Dame's initial drive, rambling 25 yards on a nifty screen pass then bouncing outside for the first Irish touchdown. Hill got an indication of what the Notre Dame defenders had in store for him on the first Purdue possession. He would finish with just 13 net yards on 13 carries. Myers zeroed in on Lake Dawson for 43 yards to set up a late second period score that gave the home team a 13-0 edge at the break. The final 30 minutes turned into the Reggie Brooks show. The senior tailback took a pitch from Meyer early in the third period and did the rest himself. 
Play action fake, option left. Here's Meyer on the run. Out to Brooks to the 40, 45. He's on the sideline. Wait to the goal line. To the 30, to 20. He's going to win it. 10-5. Touchdown, Reggie Brooks. Then it was Bettis who found the end zone from 24 yards out. Then John Covington put a halt to Purdue's most serious scoring threat of the day. That set up Brooks, who put the final touches on his 205-yard afternoon on a one-play drive. Here's the toss to Reggie Brooks, and Brooks up to the 20, 25, puts back over the middle, in the open field at the 40, right to the goal line, 50, 40, they're not going to catch him. He's down to the 20, he's at the 10, 5, touchdown, 80 yards, Reggie Brooks. Kevin McDougal ended the scoring for the Irish. Pete Bursich contributed an interception. And Brian Hamilton ensured the shutout by recovering a Purdue fumble at the Irish one with five minutes left in the game. Notre Dame's 458 rushing yards marked the most by an Irish team in 18 years. But it was the defense that kept Purdue without a first down for the first 18 minutes in the 48-0 blanking of the Boilermakers, Notre Dame's first shutout win over Purdue in 16 years. 19th ranked Stanford visited South Bend, anxious to add to its three game winning streak, while sixth rated Notre Dame aimed to protect its own unbeaten mark on a picture perfect afternoon in Notre Dame Stadium. Lou Holtz's squad got off to an auspicious debut after Stanford muffed the opening kickoff. On first down from the Cardinal 12, Demetrius DuBose unloaded on quarterback Steve Stenstrom and forced a fumble that the visitors recovered in their own end zone for safety. After the resulting free kick, Rick Meyer threw to Mike Miller for 18 yards. Then, three plays later, Reggie Brooks made it 9 nothing for the Irish. DuBose forced another turnover later in the opening period and Jermaine Holden recovered to set up Notre Dame for a 13-play scoring drive. Brooks contributed 26 yards to take the Irish into enemy territory. And Lee Becton converted on third down for 16 more. Finally, it was safety turned running back Jeff Burris who scored to make it 16-0 with five minutes left in the first half. Turnovers proved to be Notre Dame's undoing from there. The Irish fumbled the ball away on the very first play of the second half. And three plays later, Stanford had pulled to within 16-13. The Irish defense tried to do its part to keep the Cardinal at bay. Anthony Peterson nailed Stenstrom for an eight-yard loss. And the Irish pressure actually forced the Stanford signal caller to the sidelines for a play. But the Cardinal rebounded to take the lead for good with five minutes left in the third period. The Irish weren't finished yet as Meyer targeted Dawson and Bettis for major gains deep into Stanford territory before an interception ended that opportunity. The game Irish defense wouldn't quit. Mike Miller's kickoff return provided Notre Dame with field position late in the game. But it wasn't enough to prevent the 33-16 Stanford triumph, only the fifth home field loss in the last 32 games for Notre Dame. The Irish went back to basics on their trip to always tough Pittsburgh. They combined their rugged ground game with Rick Meyer's productive passing to go with a defense that would shut off the Panther running game with only 81 yards. The Panthers grabbed an early 3-0 advantage, but Notre Dame wasted little time answering the challenge. Meyer threw for 18 yards to Mike Miller. Then 37 more to Lake Dawson.
Jerome Bettis rambled eight yards for the score, and the Irish would never trail again. Bettis keynoted the second Notre Dame scoring excursion with a 29-yard gain of his own. After converting himself on fourth and one from the 18, Meyer capped off the 80-yard drive with a TD pass to Oscar McBride that broke Joe Theismann's career record for TD passes at Notre Dame. The Irish inserted their entire number two offense on their next possession, and they proved just as productive. Lee Becton headed around left end for 27. And Kevin McDougal threw 31 yards to Derek Mays for a 21-6 advantage. Tom Carter's second down interception set up the Irish again. This time it took nine plays before Jerome Bettis' run made it 28-6 at halftime. After Pitt closed to within a pair of touchdowns, Bettis took matters into his own hands gaining 17 yards on third down, then going 10 yards for his third TD of the evening. Jeff Burris ended another Panther march with a pickoff, and three plays later, Meyer hooked up with Mays. Meyer rolling out to the left side, pump fake, looks, throws the ball to the far side, Mays wide open, makes the catch at the 20, 15, 10, touchdown. Notre Dame's ever-present ground game kept up the pressure, and Pittsburgh native Paul Fela finished the Notre Dame scoring in a 52-21 blitzing of the home team. The first ever meeting between Notre Dame and Brigham Young came following an open date for the Irish. Early on, it had the makings of a slugfest between the balanced Irish offense and the Cougars' pass-oriented attack. But it was the defense that was on the mind of Irish coach Lou Holtz as he spoke to his team before the game. Went around the room last night and spent about five to six minutes with each room. One thing that was said to me was an individual made the comment. He said, they're just, I, I just don't feel a spirit out there when I'm out there on defense. Let me tell you something. You don't gain from other individuals, you give of individuals. You have a spirit, you have a faith, you have a belief, you have a goal, you have a dream, you have an enthusiasm to do something, and that spirit automatically pours out. The people that have the spirit inside for anything they do. It's a determination, it's a feeling. You can't describe it, you can't explain it, you can't feel it, you can't see it. But it's there and you know what I'm talking about. That's up to everybody to lift everybody up. But the standard we have as talented a football team has been at Notre Dame. Somebody asked me last night, I went around, what's the difference between this year's team and the 88 defense, 89? No difference in talent, no difference in work habits. You work as hard as any team I've been around in practice. But the biggest difference is a standard of expectations. That there's got to be a standard there that, hey, I don't care who we're playing or what they are, they're in our place, they ain't walking out here as a winner, and they aren't going to convert third down and they aren't going to move the ball, and I don't know who's going to catch the ball, but I'm going to tell you one thing, that sucker I'm guarding ain't going to catch it. There's got to be that standard. When we're out there on the field, I have a standard, and it's a high standard. And if you aim for perfection, you'll reach greatness. If you aim for greatness, you'll reach good. If you aim for good, you'll reach average. There's a standard, and men, your standard, the rest of your life should always be higher than your employer. Your standard as a player should always be higher than the standard is set forth by the coach. Your standard as a student should be higher than the standard set by the faculty. Don't lower that standard. Man, this is an important game. Not because of who we're playing. It's important for a bowl, but most important of all is for respect and it's for setting that god dog standard and never again allowing that sucker to come even close to anything but being the best we're capable of being. I love you. Let's go get it done. Defense paved the way for Notre Dame's first points of the day. 
as Demetrius DuBose took advantage of a misplayed handoff by BYU for an early 7-0 advantage. The Irish held the visitors to a field goal with a solid goal line stand. Notre Dame came back to convert on fourth down on a pass to Derek Mays. Then Rick Meyer found Irv Smith all by himself for a 14-3 lead. Two more Cougar field goals made it 14-9 at halftime, but Notre Dame's ball control tactics took over after intermission. Meyer started things on a big play note with a screen toss to Ray Griggs. With BYU still within range at 21-16, heading into the final period of play, Notre Dame put on a show of its own. Reggie Brooks, idle in the first half coming off a hip injury, rambled for 25. Then Jerome Bettis burst through a monstrous hole to make it 28-16 for the Irish. Jeff Burris personally held the Cougars at bay on the next possession, taking advantage of Devon McDonald's pass rush to make an interception. Brooks and Bettis combined on another Notre Dame scoring drive. Then it was McDonald and Tom Carter who stood up for the Irish defense. The multi-talented Burris waltzed into the end zone for the final Notre Dame points, then ended the last BYU challenge himself with a diving interception. The Irish held BYU to 13 net rushing yards, intercepted three of Hancock's passes, and dominated the fourth period while playing without a turnover in the impressive 42-16 victory. Slowly but surely, the Irish defense was coming of age. A trip to Giant Stadium in the New Jersey Meadowlands pitted Notre Dame and Navy. This time, Rick Meyer, Lake Dawson, and Reggie Brooks got the Irish off to an early start. Jeff Burris ran out of the T formation to make it 7-0 for Notre Dame. Following a Craig Hendrick field goal, Meyer connected with Brooks on the first reception of his career. Good for 24 yards and a 17-0 advantage. Meyer's pinpoint passing set Brooks up for another touchdown. Then, Notre Dame's senior quarterback threw to Irv Smith. Next to Derek Mays. And finally to Smith again for the 31-0 halftime edge. The Irish defense held the midshipmen at arm's length most of the afternoon. Even when Navy gambled on fourth down, the Irish were equal to the challenge. Now six, one and one, after the 38 to seven triumph that came without five injured starters, the Irish headed into a stretch run against three ranked opponents that would determine just how memorable the 92 campaign would prove to be. Ninth-ranked Boston College brought to South Bend all the makings of a Cinderella season. A coach in Tom Coughlin, who had turned around the Eagle program. A tailback in Chucky Dukes, who had run for 100 yards seven straight weeks. A quarterback in Glenn Foley, ranked among the country's passing leaders. And a defense giving up only 11 points and 111 rushing yards per game. The game had all the ingredients of a memorable trip for the Golden Eagles but it turned out to be three of the more forgettable hours of football Boston College could ever have imagined. Eighth-ranked Notre Dame dominated every minute of the football game in every way possible. Rick Meyer threw for 20 yards to Lake Dawson on the second Irish play from scrimmage, and Notre Dame was off. Jerome Bettis added 14 yards of his own. Meyer froze the BC defense and tossed to a wide open Lee Becton for the touchdown. Though he played only nine plays due to ankle problems, Bettis showed he hadn't lost his touch. 
Hand off, little play action fake. Back to throw, near side, Bettis. 25 on the sideline, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown Irish. Then it was the defense's turn as Carmelia McGill forced a Foley fumble and Brian Hamilton recovered on the Eagle 21. This time it was Meyer who sprinted 26 yards on third down to make it 21-0. After Foley endured successive sacks by McGill, then Radigan and McDonald, the Irish offense took over again. This time it was Reggie Brooks who took the last second pitch from Meyer for the points. McDonald nailed Foley once again for an 11 yard loss, setting up Brooks for another of his patented big plays. Notre Dame's 37-0 halftime margin featured an offense that rolled up 347 total yards in two periods and limited Boston College to 11 total yards, minus seven on the ground. Irv Smith caught one Meyer pass for 24 yards. Then Jeff Burris made his first career reception, good for six points on the initial second half possession for the Irish. Notre Dame turned the ball over at its own 13, but even then the visitors couldn't take advantage. Demetrius Dubose stopped Dukes cold on second down. And Burris intercepted a throw tipped by Greg Lane on fourth down. Derek Mays added to his impressive rookie resume in the final period. Brooks finished with 174 yards while passing the 1,000 yard mark. And Meyer threw three TD passes. But it was the Notre Dame defense that looked most impressive, stopping 12 of 13 third down plays against a previously unbeaten BC team, averaging 31 points and 465 total yards per game. The score marked the most points ever scored by Notre Dame against a ranked opponent, as the Irish outgained the Eagles 576 to 176 in total yards. The Irish came into their final home game of the 92 campaign with plenty of thoughts on their mind. It was to be the final game of the eventful series against Penn State, as well as a chance for the Irish to win games at home on successive Saturdays against ranked teams for only the third time in Notre Dame history. But more than anything, it was a chance for captains Rick Meyer, Demetrius Dubose, Irv Smith, and Devon McDonald to leave Notre Dame Stadium for the last time with smiles on their faces, something that hadn't happened for the last two senior classes. The contest opened optimistically enough for the Irish. Taking the opening kickoff, Notre Dame moved methodically for 53 yards, gaining 14 on a third down throw from Meyer to Smith. When Craig Hendrick booted the field goal through from 26 yards, five minutes into the contest, the Irish led 3-0. Tom Carter and John Covington combined for an interception on Penn State's first drive, but Notre Dame was unable to convert it into points. After freshman Bobby Taylor blocked a PAT following a Penn State touchdown, the snow and freezing temperatures began to make footing treacherous. Jim Flanagan forced a fumble by Penn State's Kerry Collins that Brian Radigan finally latched onto at the Penn State 14. The Irish barely missed converting on fourth down from the five, but the Irish did come back on their final try of the half to tie the score. Derek Mays took a near interception away from a Penn State defender, and Reggie Brooks displayed his hurdling ability for a gain of 13. Hendricks' kick from 31 yards out made it 6-6. The biggest gain of the game by either side came midway through the third period 
as Meyer found Lake Dawson for 30 yards. That enabled Hendrick to convert his third field goal chance, this one from 37 yards, for a 9-6 Irish lead. But the Nittany Lions tied the game with 8.35 left after a much needed goal line stand. And then took a 16-9 lead on a touchdown with 4.19 on the clock. Notre Dame seniors then led the Irish on a march that produced a conclusion now emblazoned on the minds of the 59,075 fans in the stadium. On second and 10, Meyer found Jerome Bettis for 21 yards down the near sideline. On second and 16, Meyer scrambled himself within a yard of the first down. Two plays later, he found Ray Griggs at the Penn State 17 with less than two minutes to go. From first and goal at the nine, Brooks scampered for five to the four. But Meyer was stopped after a gain of one and his third down throw bounced at Brooks' feet. The Irish had to use their final timeout to discuss a fourth and goal play to come from the Penn State three. They would use a play Lou Holtz normally liked to reserve for two-point conversions. Flank to the right is Reggie Brooks. One running back, Jerome Bettis. Back to throw. Over the middle. Pass to Bettis. Touchdown, Notre Dame! Jerome Bettis with a touchdown! He is mobbed in the end zone! With no timeouts remaining, Holtz and Meyer again combined their thoughts on the two-point conversion call that would win or lose the game with 20 seconds left on the clock. For Meyer, the other seniors, and their teammates, it proved to be a scenario they'll never forget. Three wide outs left, one out to the right. Back to throw, Meyer looks, 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 rolls to the right, pump fake, throws the ball, it is caught, Reggie Brooks! Reggie Brooks got it for a two-pointer, and Notre Dame is out in front, 17-16, with 20 seconds left. It was only the second pass reception ever by Brooks in a game, but it proved to be one for the memory books. As the players raised their helmets to the student section for the final time, the seniors could revel in the knowledge that their last efforts in Notre Dame Stadium constituted one of the greatest clutch finishes ever by a Notre Dame team. After an open date, Fifth-ranked Notre Dame traveled to Los Angeles to battle 19th-rated USC with a couple of goals in mind. The Irish not only were seeking their 10th straight triumph over the Trojans in this storied rivalry, but also were trying to defeat a ranked opponent in three straight games for only the fourth time in Notre Dame history. The Trojans figured to pose a particularly major challenge for Notre Dame's running attack, thanks to a defense giving up less than 100 yards per game on the ground. But the Irish offensive line, led by seniors Justin Hall, Lindsey Knapp, and Todd Norman, plus juniors Aaron Taylor and Tim Ruddy, decided to make an early statement of its own. After a USC field goal, Notre Dame's first possession began with an eight-yard burst by Reggie Brooks. Notre Dame needed only seven plays, all runs, to take the lead. For Brooks, it was just the beginning of an evening he would long remember. The Trojans rebounded to grab a 13-10 advantage late in the second period. But Notre Dame's senior tailback made certain it didn't last long with a spectacular response. The Notre Dame defense made a statement of its own as the second half began. Rick Meyer combined with Irv Smith for a 29-yard gain to start the offense rolling. Then on first and 10, Brooks shook off effects of a stomach virus to work his magic one more time. The Irish stop troops continue to match wits with the Trojan aerial show. A season-high six sacks 
ensured that Trojan quarterback Rob Johnson became more familiar than he might have liked with Devon McDonald, Bryant Hamilton, and Bryant Young. In the end, it was the relentless Notre Dame running game that earned superior marks in front of 90,000 fans in the Los Angeles Coliseum. On his way to a career-high 227-yard effort, Brooks blazed into the secondary and the record books time and time again. Bettis finished off the scoring with an eight-yard touchdown run of his own for a 31-23 lead. USC had one last opportunity, and the Trojans were knocking at the door with a first down at the Irish Five with less than a minute remaining. But Devon McDonald nailed Johnson for a seven-yard loss. Finally, it was junior cornerback Tom Carter who cemented the win with 10 seconds remaining with a pressure-packed play of his own. The Irish finished with 330 ground yards against the nation's sixth-ranked rushing defense. It was a fitting finale for Brooks and the rest of the seniors as they ended the regular season with Notre Dame's sixth consecutive victory. Coach Lou Holtz knew at this point that his Irish had developed into a complete football team that was as competent as any in the country. The trail of memories left to savor by the 1992 Irish comprised the story of a football team's coming of age. Despite losing six offensive players from the previous season to the NFL, Notre Dame's 92 attack proved to be one of the most prolific in Irish history when it came to gobbling up yardage and putting points on the scoreboard. Lou Holtz's team proved difficult to defend more than anything because of its multiple weapons and the many ways in which they could be deployed. On defense, the Irish displayed steady bursts of improvement until by year's end, the Notre Dame productivity on that side of the football nearly matched that on offense. For captains Demetrius DuBose, Rick Meyer, Irv Smith, and Devon McDonald, it all came together in a satisfying stretch run that produced three consecutive victories over ranked teams Boston College, Penn State, and USC to cap the regular season, with a Cotton Bowl matchup with unbeaten Texas A&M still to come. And what of those standards set and the commitments made by Holtz and his Irish long before the 92 campaign began? A 9-1-1 regular season ending with a six-game winning streak and a top-five national ranking provided all the answers they could have wanted. <laughs>